Gospel of Mark, chapter 11, verse 27. Then they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. And they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? But Jesus answered and said to them, I also will ask you one question, then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people, for all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they answered and said to Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now at vintage time he sent a servant to the vine dressers that he might receive some of the fruit of the vineyard from the vine dressers. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again he sent them another servant, and at him they threw stones, wounded him in the head, and sent him away shamefully treated. And again he sent another, and him they killed, and many others, beating some and killing some. Therefore still having one son, his beloved, he also sent him to them last, saying, They will respect my son. But those vine dressers said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the vine dressers and give the vineyard to others. Have you not even read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. And they sought to lay hands on him, but feared the multitude, for they knew he had spoken the parable against them. So they left him and went away. Then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Then some Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him, and they asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies, and leaves his wife behind, and leaves no children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and dying, he left no offspring. And the second took her, and he died. Nor did he leave any offspring. And the third likewise. So the seven had her, and left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be? For all seven had her as wife. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken, because you do not know the Scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But concerning the dead, that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the burning bush passage, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. You are therefore greatly mistaken. The one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that no one dared question him. Then Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? And the common people heard him gladly. Then he said to them in his teaching, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greetings in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Amen. Now the fullness of time has come, so that the written word of God may be fulfilled, but also the mission of Jesus Christ, for which he was sent on earth, from heaven, from his Father, upon this earth. And the mission of Christ was for three and a half years. First of all, to preach the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, the new doctrine of eternal life, and moreover to bind the devil so that the work of God may progress. He had to strip the devil from his powers because the devil had great authority until the crucifixion of Christ. He had to strip the devil from his strength with the crucifixion of himself, and with his resurrection to give a new birth to men. This was the first mission. The second mission that he had of our Lord Jesus Christ was to choose the people through which he would found, he would create his church from zero. Because um, God, my beloved brethren, through Jesus Christ, created the church, his people. Just as God, through Abraham in the Old Testament, created the old people of God in the Old Testament, the church of the Old Testament, the people of Israel. Servant in the church of the Old Testament was Moses. But the son in the people of the New Testament is Jesus Christ, and he has all authority. He creates. He builds up. He edifies, because he is God. And he himself said that, you are Peter, he told Peter that he chose that you are Peter and upon this rock I, Jesus Christ, will build my church. I will build my church. It doesn't exist now, but I will build it. Something that he did. And from then on, with the same authority that God sent out Jesus Christ to build up his church, with the same authority Jesus Christ sent out people to edify and build his church. And how is this church built up? With the ministries that Christ gave to people and he places in the church and also with the gifts of the Holy Spirit which operate in the church. And with this whole procedure of the service and worship of the First Apostolic Church. But as we said, the work of God now is entering the final phase. It's the most difficult phase. And always the final phase is the most difficult. It is where... The enemy of our soul resists with all his might, and there where the work progresses rapidly. It's the end. Because in the end, everything counts. The simplest mistake can cost us everything. The end is the rapture of the church for us. 
It is very serious for us. You have to be ready. You have to be prepared, approved. You have to have overcome. You have to have done many things. You have to have realized that you are going toward heaven. You have to have denied yourself, followed Christ. You have to have uh, fought a good fight and kept your faith. The end is the most difficult part of all. The most difficult part is the examinations that we give and sit for. And now the end is coming for Jesus Christ. He has to enter Jerusalem like the Lamb of God. He has to be tested for four days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. On the fifth day, he must be crucified. And on the seventh day, he must rise, rise again. This is God's plan. And he must follow through with his plan and fulfill it. Wherever he is able, he does what he must. And whatever he cannot do, his father does. And we will examine this from the first day, from Palm Sunday, as they say in Greece. He has to enter triumphantly. Already he has risen Lazarus from the dead. Already all the people now have acknowledged and because of the confirmation of his heavenly father, God the Father in his life, because of the miracles and the activities, people have accepted him. He himself said to the scribes and Pharisees, If you do not believe in my words, believe at least in my works, which I do not perform but my Father. And God works. He acts. He has to enter triumphantly, but on a donkey. And where will he find a donkey? He doesn't have anything. And so we can do the work of God we do not have. But the Lord provides. We do not have faith. The Lord provides for us. It's not only material things. Spiritual things are even more necessary. We don't have love. We don't have acknowledgement of the gospel. We do not have many things. We lack many things. But the Lord is the one who provides. But so the Lord can provide, you have to believe Him. And so you can enjoy the things that the Lord provides. You must obey His word. Abraham enjoyed the things that God had foreseen for him and predestined for him. Even the sacrifice of the ram. And the promise by oath to Abraham. Why? Because he was faithful to the word of God, to the voice of our Lord. And now Jesus Christ must reveal himself faithful. He needs a donkey. My father has provided. Go and you will find a donkey tied up. Take it. And if people tell you, why do you take this? Say the Lord needs it. And they will let you have it. Now, a disciple who doesn't have faith, could say, what is this now? What, we're going to go steal a donkey now? This isn't right. I'm not going to steal a donkey of a stranger. But the disciples have learned now. Have we learned? They have learned that what Jesus Christ says is yes and amen. It's the perfect truth. The word of God cannot be wrong. The word of God cannot lie. And it is impossible for God not to confirm his word. He is faithful. He is faithful to His Word. He cannot deny Himself. And without hesitation, the disciples, two of them, go down, they find the donkey tied up, they loose it and bring it back. What are you doing there? They ask them. What are you stealing the stranger's donkey? The Lord needs it. Oh, okay then. Have it. Go. It is so easy. It is easy when we believe. It is difficult when we lose faith. And that is how our life is, my brethren. And I want to point this out. Because the Lord told us that we must strive to enter through the narrow gate. And later on, there is a difficult way that we must walk in. And the difficult way is difficult, obviously. But we must point out that it is difficult for those who do not believe, who do not trust Christ and His words. But to the people who trust the power of Christ and the words of Jesus Christ, their life is easy. Because it is not for us to do things, but Christ goes before us. We will do one thing and must do one thing. We must follow the commandments, His word, and the voice of the Holy Spirit and walk in the way that Christ has taught us. This is the difficulty for us. Difficult is for us to submit our heart 
to not desire its own things. It is difficult for us to tame our body and to bring it into subjection under the word of God. So easily the disciples found the donkey. They brought it. Our Lord climbed on the donkey, sat on it, and entered Jerusalem with palms and branches. Everyone was rejoicing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of God. Of course, in their mind, these people, they had their deliverance from the Romans. Because the Romans oppressed them. They were cruel dictators, cruel conquerors. But, what matters is not what we have in mind, my brethren. My beloved brethren, we must be very, very, very careful with this. It is not, the important thing is not what we desire, what we believe, or what we think is right, what we desire to happen or want to happen. If we remain in these things that are our own, we prove before God and all powers that we lack faith. What does we lack faith mean? We do not trust that Christ has prepared for us the best that accompany salvation. We do not trust His words that they are the power of God that saves. But we try with our own sight to walk. Things that we try do not happen. We get disappointed and then we say it's God's fault. This is what happens usually. This is what usually happens. I want this and I believe that God is with me and He will help me. If He truly is with you and it is His will, it will happen. But since it did not happen or nothing is happening, God doesn't want it. Let's not get disappointed or saddened and cry and persist and be miserable while we must be happy and rejoicing and say, Jesus, I thank you very much that you did not permit this to happen because who knows what evil would happen through that. And you have prepared something a lot better and who knows how much good will come through that. This is a thought of faith, like Abraham. He said, you must kill your child. He said, no, even if I kill my child, God will raise it from the dead. He has promised me and he has sworn also. No, he hadn't sworn back then, that's a mistake. But he had promised me that in my seed, all the nations shall be blessed. He believes in his word. My brethren, let us ask from God to make us believe his words. To trust Christ. So that we may be happy. So that we, we may be blessed. And that we may be able to follow His footsteps precisely. Otherwise, our way will be very difficult. I want to share something with you that God had shown me in the beginning of my faith. What the difficult way means and sorrowful path. I was at the feet of a mountain. A mountain that was very high, very steep, and very rugged. It had a path that appeared, you could see the path, but it was full of rocks and stones, jagged stones that were... It was very difficult to walk that path. And I was trying to walk in that path. And I went on, but my, but my progress was very slow and very laboring. So when I lifted my eyes up to the peak, I said, I cannot reach that peak. It's impossible. So I continued, but my labor was in vain. And I said, Jesus, what am I going to do? I was in despair and disappointment. It's the disappointment and despair of the person who does not trust God. He does not call upon God. And he tries to do things on his own and succeed on his own. And at that moment, the Lord appears before me. And even more, he stood before me, not looking at me, but I could see his back right in front of me. And he started walking. And I thought, how I thought about this, I do not know. It was a revelation by God. But I thought when Jesus lifted his foot, I'd step my foot in his footstep. As soon as he lifted the other, I put my other foot in his footstep. And in the beginning, he was walking very slowly until I learned how to follow his lead. But as long as I stepped on the footsteps, exactly on the footsteps of Jesus Christ, then my walk became easier, quicker, and from then on, I could reach the peak. But I ceased looking at the mountain. I stopped looking at the path. I stopped looking at the difficulties that were around, the problems and the rugged path that I was walking in. I just observed where Christ stepped His feet and where He lifted them from. And in the end, we were walking fast. 
We weren't running, but we were walking fast. And I knew that I was going to reach my destination because it was easy and I knew where I was stepping. This is faith, my brethren. We look at the gospel. What should we do? Let us continue in prayer and believe in prayer. Prayer has power in here. He walks in on Sunday. He sees in the house of God, the temple of God, people who bought and sold in the temple. He saw money changers and people who saw, sold doves and different things of the sort. And everyone passed by with vessels through the temple. And it was the marketplace, a flea market, where people took advantage of the other people who were going to worship God. And he got angry. And he got angry because he said, It is written that my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. My house is a house of prayer, and you have made it a den of thieves. You sell and buy in this temple. And the main theme in the temple those days was trading money. May God keep us, my brethren. May God protect us from this. The church of Christ, that today is the house of the living God, is a house of prayer. Do you know how easily it can be changed? It can be transformed into a musical center, into an exhibition of beautiful voices, into an exhibition of beautiful clothing. Have you seen how people get dressed to go to church these days? They wear expensive dresses. They show off their clothes. And this happens in the church. But when you go to church, you must have a target, a goal, to pray. What does prayer mean? I must meet Christ. I am going to pray, I am going to communicate, and make a discussion with my Lord. This is the house of God. And he started driving the animals out. He took a whip also and started beating the animals and cast them all out, even the money changers. And the scribes and Pharisees got angry. The next day, on Monday, the next day, because when he went into Jerusalem, it was late in the afternoon. The next day, he went into Jerusalem again. As he went back to Jerusalem again, he saw fig tree on his way, and the scripture says he got hungry, and he approached it to eat a fig. And I really like both of these traits of Jesus Christ. First of all, he was hungry. He's a clean man. And in the work of God, there are needs. He got hungry, and he approached the fig tree to eat a fig, but he found none. And even more, the scripture says something. It says that it wasn't the season for fruit. And so he cursed the fig tree. And here many people get sad. They say, why did he curse the fig tree? It wasn't its season. Christ is not interested in fig trees. He is interested in what happens afterward. You see something, and it doesn't look right. It doesn't click into your conscience well. And we live this. I don't like this. Don't look at what you do not like now. Look at what will happen afterward. He cursed it and said, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. The disciples heard him. He said, What is he doing now? He's cursing a fig tree. But he has a lesson to give his disciples, and they need it. They left that night. Tuesday morning, they came back again. They passed by the fig tree, and they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And this is why he did it now. He turns to them and says, Do not marvel at this, because most assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. This is the lesson here. And I want to point this out again. Something doesn't click in our heart from the things that Christ did. It does not satisfy our soul. We do not like it. Don't haste to condemn it and say, this isn't from God. Don't, don't be in a hurry. Wait. Wait to see what Christ and God wants to do through this. Have God-like faith, he says. Because whoever of you has the faith of God and does not hesitate in his heart, whatever he says is done in the name of Christ. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Whatever you ask 
and prayer for, believe that they will happen when you ask for them, and they will happen. But here we must be very careful, my brethren. We will not ask from God to do the things that we want. We will ask from God to do the things that He wants. This is the first lesson of the power of faith. That is, simply, in simple words, Brother, you have great power within you. You have power from God. And the power that you have are the words of Christ. The gospel of Christ is the power of God that works only in the person who believes. Is there a chance for your faith to not work? Of course. When? He says here, Whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. So, your prayer will not have strength. You will have no power if your sins remain upon you. But I asked for the blood of Christ. I repented. I wept. Did you forgive? If you did not forgive, then no matter how much you repented, you are not forgiven. These are great truths and very serious things for our life, for our course. And how did Christ explain all these things? Through cursing the fig tree that did not have fruit because it wasn't in its season. And the disciples were saddened, as we are saddened also. Why did he curse the poor fig tree? Will we look at the poor fig tree or will we look at the things that Christ wants to teach us? We will look at the things that he wants to tell us, wants to show us. That there is power in your word, which is by faith, if you have forgiven, that is, if your sins have also been forgiven. The disciples must understand the power that they have through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must all understand this. And our weakness, the weakness that we have even though we hold in our hands the gospel of Christ, when we haven't forgiven the ones that have harmed us. And always, my beloved brethren, let us stand in this. We see a person and our heart is a bit bent out of shape. I say this from experience because we are all of like suffering. Oh, that person over there, I just can't stand him. And I may be right. It doesn't matter if I'm right. It matters. What matters is what the Word of God says because the Word of God is right. I am not right. He did this and that to me and the other. Forgive him, my brother. Forgive him. Set him free. Loose him from your bondage. You have him tied up. But not only that, you are also tied up with that. Let the man go. He made a mistake. So what? Haven't you ever made mistakes? But he wronged me. So what? It doesn't matter if they wrong us, if people wrong us. What matters is if God justifies us. That is what matters. Now, if that person or the other doesn't justify me, and if he's an unbeliever even, he's a poor man. If he's a believer, he's a poor man. And if he's my brother, he's even poorer than that. He made a mistake. He will repent. Because if he doesn't repent, he's lost. But he will repent. And I will not examine his mistake now. I will examine my mistakes more correctly. I will not examine his sins. I will examine my sins. I, do, I am not satisfied with the fact that I went to Christ and I said, Forgive me, Lord. He doesn't forgive me that way. He doesn't forgive me. No, he does not. But the blood of Christ does not clean me from every sin. Only if I have fellowship with God. But I do not have fellowship with God if I've tied up a person because of his sins and I haven't forgiven him. These are beautiful lessons and very serious lessons through this dried up fig tree. There, the scribes and Pharisees appear. Who are you who come into the temple and send out the money changers, the sellers, the merchants? You overturn the tables and their stools. By what authority do you do these things? Who are you? And that's what they ask us also. Who are you? Who do you think you are? Why do you do these things? Let us never ask, Who are you? Anyone. Who do you think you are? He is the person that Christ saved. And what is he doing? God will show in the end. Shame of you. What are these things that you're saying? Forget about these things now. Leave the man alone so we can see what he will do. 
Besides, we are not rulers here. Whoever is led by the Holy Spirit is truly a child of God. Neither are we led by people, but neither do we want to lead people. Woe to us! Woe to us! We can comfort, we can strengthen, we can serve, we can pray for people, we can assist people. This, these things are our obligation. But to guide, rule, and lead, never. Especially in families. It is forbidden someone to enter another man's family. Because he is a transgressor when he does this. The scripture says that the head of the wife is her husband. Who are you, man? Even if you are an elder or a pastor, and you go between the husband and wife, far be it from you. You do not have authority there. God has given you no authority there. Or if you're a mother-in-law, you can't go between the husband and wife. Or whatever you may be. Father-in-law, mother-in-law, elder, father, brother. Leave the people alone to walk with Christ. Head of the wife is her husband. And even more, you will not go to the husband to tell him how he's going to rule his family. The head of the husband is Christ. What is it proper for me and you to go and tell them what to do? Why? No, he's my child, they say. He's my child, I'm going to go tell him what to do. Oh, really? Leave the man alone. Let him do anything he likes. If you can pray for him, if you can help him, do it. But what, you're going to go rebuke them? Why? Now, if they are in sin, then you will rebuke them and strictly. Those who sin, we rebuke them strictly. But we do not mingle with families. A family is a holy unit that God has predestined. Now, how the mother will raise her child, God and her husband will show her. Now, how the husband will govern his family, Christ will show him. But if they come and ask for help from you, come please tell us your opinion here. Then you will go with great fear in your heart. Because if your opinion is destructive, you are lost, my poor friend. You are lost. A family comes in and tells you, what should we do here with our child? Well, beat it up. So they can come to church. Example now. And you see the kid, it's disappeared out of church. Now how will you look at God or this family after that? And you need to be very careful. You need to have great respect. We do not know everything, my brethren. We do not know everything. And when we go to some people, we must know that they are better than us. We won't go to them with oppressive words of human wisdom. Do you know who I am? Who are you? Who do you think you are? You are nothing. And there's a very nice saying here in Greece, which says, whatever the housekeeper knows, not even does the whole world know. Do you know what happens in their family? Will you enter their family? If they ask for help, you will pray with great fear in your heart, you will have guidance from God, and then you will share your opinion. Otherwise, your opinion will be destructive. What can I tell you, my brethren? As many times as I share my opinion, I tremble, and it is never the best. And I have realized that there is no wisdom in man. There is only the voice of God. There is only guidance from God and word of God that can have good results. By what authority do you do these things? Our Lord did not say, you know who I am? He doesn't say such things. He is not, the Word of God is not that way. Humbly, He will silence them. I will ask you first, and then I will answer you if you answer me. By what authority did John baptize? By authority from heaven, or with human authority? He did whatever he did. By what authority? My, my, what do you say now? If we say that it was, the authority of man was by men, then the others believe that he is a prophet, they will stone us. But if we say that he is from heaven, then they will ask us, why did you not believe in him? That is how God works, my brethren. He doesn't work with oppressive means. He works in a humble manner. Humbly, wisely, calmly, sweetly, especially with revelation and inspiration by God. We do not tell you, they say. Well, neither will I. And from now on, his trial begins. But I want to tell you something else, and I can tell you this. It's a good parable. There was a man who planted the vineyard. He set a hedge around it, dug a place for the wine vat, 
and built a tower, and leased it to vine dressers, and went into a far country. Uh, a vineyard that is perfect here, hedged in with good vines, with a wine vat. It's always it's all ready. You just have to go and work there. This is the Church of Christ. Especially this applies to us. Everything is ready. You come into the church. What should I do? Come in and God will give you something to do. Who will tell me what to do? The Lord will tell you what to do. The Lord will reveal to you. Because if any man tells you what to do, you are lost, my friend. Will you do this, please? No, I won't do that. Our habit in the church is we say, there are these jobs that need to be covered. Who will do it? And immediately the Lord stirs up hearts. And I'm really glad when I see this. I'm glad when I see God stirring hearts and people do everything. God is my witness. I have never told anyone what to do in the church. And you are also my witnesses. I've never told anyone. And I do not want to tell anyone and I will never tell anyone because I will place a person where he ought not be. But the Lord places people where they're supposed to be. A man must wait. Another parable says that he passed by to find workers so they can work for him and he saw them waiting. And he asked them, why didn't you go to work? No one came to hire us, they said. Today, I understood that God has stirred up three couples to go to Australia. I said, again, the same thing. Again, the same thing. I've never told anyone. And I didn't know who they were. But God stirred them up. God stirs up other people to go there to do this and do that. This is the church of Christ. The church that is led by the Holy Spirit. And it has Christ as its governor. And we all are servants. We serve one another. And with all certainty, we know that the other person is better than us. With all certainty. Now lately I understand these things even better. I see how useless I am. And everything, I can do nothing. Everybody else knows a lot more and is better than me. I'll tell you an example. Internet. I do not know what I can do there. Are they not superior than me, all those children that are up there? In Australia, I didn't do anything there. Aren't all those people who work there better than me? Every day I see that other people are a lot, a lot, a lot better than me in sustaining the church materially. Can I do anything? All the people who keep the church going are a lot better than me. All the rest are a lot, a lot better than me in spiritual issues. The same thing applies. And who are we? We, my brethren, are people who have obtained mercy by Christ. All of us. I am not only useless, but we are all useless in here. And I'm not the one who says this. Christ says it. He says, If you do all the word of God, then you will see and you will be able to observe. And you will not say this in a fake, humble manner. But when you do the whole word of God, then you will see that you are useless. All the rest are useful and you are nothing. And my beloved brethren, this is a nice thought. The thought of Christ. This is the mind of Christ. When he says, taking on the form of a bondservant, he humbled himself. To whom did he humble himself? To people. He never insulted anyone. And he goes on with his parable and says, He sent workers to get some fruit and they killed the first, they killed the second, they killed the third, fourth, fifth, they killed everyone. And now, the Pharisees started saying, oh, This is for us. And the word of God is for us, my brethren. But my brethren, it depends. Do you hear it as a Pharisee or as a sincere disciple of Christ? As a sincere disciple of Christ because his word is the truth. A few years ago, I could not understand the verse, see others as higher than you. Time had to go by so I can understand it. Have I understood it completely now? No, not completely. But I have understood it a bit better. And at some point, I believe I will completely understand it. This is the church of Christ. This is the people of God, with ears ready to hear the voice of God. I'll do this. What are you saying? You're not going to do this. Okay, I won't do this, Lord. Immediately we change our opinion. Immediately. We are not stubborn. We are not self-minded. And every attempt, the self-minded person is wrong. We see that something did not go well. It wasn't as we thought it would be. Immediately we turn. Immediately we turn. Toward where? Toward where the Holy Spirit guides you. 
But is it ever possible now for my young daughter Alexia many years ago to have God's voice in her mouth? It was easier back then for her. God has spoken to us many times through Alexia. When I gather them all as a family, do this. But now she's grown up and she isn't as she was when she was young. Now she's gone bad. But when my daughter was young, we'd all pray together. And I said, we have this problem. Ask my wife and children. That is how we led, ruled our house. What should we do now? We all knelt down and prayed together. And then we said, what do you say, what do you say, what do you say? And the weakest of all said the most correct thing. And the mistakes, I made the biggest mistakes, who was the oldest. But then we made a common decision, a correct decision, because our decision was from God. And then God favored us. They would not go through difficulties, many difficulties. Many difficulties, I assure you. Did we not go through financial difficulties? Once my wife came out of a bank with 25,000 drachmas in her hand and she said, This is all, Lord. We had to pay tutoring. We had to pay all these things. It's over, we said, Lord. We have only this money. We don't have a job. Nothing else. But God did not forsake us. Immediately, He sent His answer. My brethren, there is no one who is better. There is only one who is better, and that is Christ. Who are we? We are small and significant. You know... Job, when he was exalted, when the Lord brought him closer to him, and he opened his eyes, until that point, he only heard him. And he saw him, and he said, when God blessed him, he saw him, and he said, I am wretched and vile, and I dare to open my mouth against God. So long he hadn't realized that he was wretched and vile. But when he came into God's presence, then he said, my, my, I am wretched. That's what Christ says also. When you will do all the will of God, then you will realize that you are useless, and you will say, I am a useless servant, Lord, a worthless servant, nothing, when you will do all of God's will. As long as you are mm, a bit here and a bit there, you think that you are a bit important also. We are not important. We are empty tin cans. We are not important. None of us is important. And if at some point we have something that seems to be important, it is by the grace of God that we have this. God can just snatch it away from us, and there goes our importance. God says that we are like the flower in the valley. The valley dries up, there goes its glory. Flower dried up, there goes its glory. In the end, He sends His Son also, and says, well, they will respect my Son. But they said, my, my, this is the heir, let us kill him. Look at their cunningness, their wickedness. May God keep us from such wickedness, my brethren. And we keep such wickedness in our hearts sometimes. And it does not please God. I'll do this, but I will tell no one about it. And that's why I say, when someone comes and tells me, I will tell you something, but don't tell anyone, then I answer him, I will say it from the pulpit. Only the church will know it. It is different if it's a confession or something personal. Okay, we do not make known the personal issues of every person, even though I share with you all my personal issues. Because in the people who are clean, everything is clean. We have nothing to lose. If we share our mistakes, it is probably for edification. We do not become smaller. Christ becomes bigger. I made a mistake. What can I do? I do not like it, and I will admit it. Why should I not admit it? Why should I not admit my mistake? And when other people hear that we have made mistakes, they say, oh, he made a mistake. And then they excuse themselves, and it is good. We go to Christ, and then he corrects our issues. But wickedness here will kill him, and will inherit the vineyard. Is that how you think you're going to inherit the vineyard? There are some people who say, I'm waiting for him to die so I can inherit him. They die first. My brethren, never wait for someone to die so you can inherit him. You are in danger if you do this. I'm not waiting for anyone to die. I want everyone to live. I want everyone to partake in the rapture of the church. But he says he is an obstacle in my life. I want him to die because he is an obstacle in my life. Wait a minute. He has his own path and you have your own path. Follow your way and he will follow his way. Why do you have to collide? Why do you have to crash? Everyone follows his own way. There are no obstacles in your way. And let us not see anyone as an obstacle. Even more, there's another way of thought that is terrible. You can see this in your work environment and sometimes in the church. He says, 
The things that I know I will not share with you so you do not learn them and pass me. Whoever works in that way in their business, you see a chief worker and he never shows something to his helper. When they want to do a trick, they send away their helper and then they say, come back here, carry this. This man will leave. The helper will leave and will become better than the boss. The more we show people, look at the difference, the more God blesses us. The more we give to people so other people can do, so much more God blesses us. The more we share things with others, the more does God give to us. And it is sensible. If I decide to do this and do the other and the other and that over there, I will do these things. But God won't give me anything else to do. He can't do anything else. He can't give you anything else to do. But when I give this, and I give that, and I teach this to that person, and I show them how to do this and that, then God comes and shows you and shows you because you are empty. And the same thing applies, my beloved brethren, and money and charity. The more you give, the more God will give you. God has appointed, and this is the truth that I'm telling you, for example, that for all of us, we should have a status. You, George Corovesi, will get so much money. Let's say 1,000 euro a month. If this 1,000 euro a month I keep for myself, that's what I will stay. But if I start giving this money and I bring it down to 200, then he will give you another 800 so I can have 1,000. And he will continue to give me because God wants me at a level. Not living in prodigality, but in the name of Christ. Given the work of God. God does not please with prodigality. We don't sit around and have 45 pairs of shoes. What are we, centipedes? What, we can't have 25 suits. What can we do with 25 suits? We will have what is necessary. And if you want just a small luxury, God will forgive it, but it must be small. I believe that God forgives me a luxury because I have a small a t a desire, a luxury that I permit to myself. I like a bottle of wine. Not that I drink a lot, but I like a good bottle of wine that may cost 5 euro, let's say, or 7 euro sometimes. It's not good. My, my wife looks at me strangely, but I say, God forgives me this. It's okay. But God has a status for all of us. The more we hold on to that status, and even more, if we pass our status by holding on to our money, the level that we have, then God will take away from us so we can come down. The more we give in the work of God, in the word of God, to the people who are in need, then God brings and fills. The same thing applies to spiritual things. The bigger the vessel you take to Him, the more He will fill it. If you take Him a little cup this big and tell him fill it, he will fill it. If you take him a can this big, he will fill it. And if you take him a big barrel and say fill it Lord, he will fill it. What you take to him is what matters. My brethren, Christ is rich. He is wealthy, our Heavenly Father. And I cannot tell you something, he is also open-handed. He gives away openly and freely to everyone about everything. But if you are stingy, he will give you in a stingy way. If you give, he will give you much. Try it and you will see. He says it to the poor widow. He observes the poor widow. He observed the rich people who went and gave a lot of money. Well done. He had a thousand euro and gave the twenty. That is good. That person had two thousand euro and gave fifty euro. That is very good. And the widow, she had one quadrant. And she gave that quadrant. And God was amazed. He said, come here, come here. Did you see that woman, that widow? The others gave from their abundance. But she gave from her want. She gave everything that she had. Whom will I bless now? Whom will I bless? But you'll tell me, why was the widow poor? Couldn't he bless her beforehand? He could bless her beforehand, but God knows what he's doing. He knows what he is doing. He doesn't want wickedness. He wants good people, kind people. He doesn't want stingy people. He wants wise people with understanding. You know what he calls us? Good stewards in spiritual matters and material matters. He wants us to be good stewards. You have to be a good steward. Not be a good stingy man. You must be a good steward. Neither must you be good at wasting money. You must be a good steward. Can your hands be open to the work of God? You will see what God will do. And I encourage you all to try it, all of us. 
Try it and you will see. But keep your pocketbook closed when it has to do with our pleasures. I want to go waste money for my pleasure. Wait a minute. What pleasure? I'll build big warehouses so I can fill them. Wait a minute. And what are you going to do with all those possessions? I'll keep it for my old age. Well, wait till you get old. Wait till you get old. Have you guaranteed that you will get old? Wait until you get old and then you'll see. Glory be to God. My beloved brethren, we thank God for His Word. He gives us wisdom. He leads us. Let's kill him so we can have his inheritance. The inheritance won't be yours that way. Other people curse each other. They say, I'll go to a witch, she will cast a spell on him and he will die. Then you'll be in the devil's hands and that won't be that nice. By using his powers. My brethren, when we pray, let us only pray for good. For good. For blessing. In our mind, let us always have what is good, only what is kind, only what is holy and blessed. I see people that God uses and He has an intention to use them even more. And I tell them, be careful of three things. The Word of God, your sanctification, and your family. These are the three things that matter. You require wisdom from God. You need to be a good husband, good father, a good wife, a good mother. How will you become wise? God will make us. You won't have competition within you. My children are better than his. They should become better than his. They will never become. My children are the best and the most clever and the most pretty of all. They're neither clever, nothing. You must wrong your children in favor of other people's children. Don't favor your children above other children. You must wrong them so God can justify them. You must humble your soul and heart. Before every situation, what we are interested in is God's blessing. Amen? One thing we are interested in, having God's favor in our life. And we will have God's favor only through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Neither with wickedness, neither with cleverness, neither with wisdom, neither with abilities, none of all these things. All these things are useless. Only if God decides to bless you, you will be blessed. It's over. Do you agree with this? Only God. Only God, if He decides to bless you, you will be blessed. Otherwise, even if you succeed, you will be miserable. When they, dis they realized that He was talking about them, they got angry. They said, let us kill Him, but they, they got afraid. They were afraid. They said, what will the people say? And they decided more cunningly now. And my brethren, look at this. Hypocrites go on from cunningness to cunningness, from wickedness to wickedness. Now we'll send someone to trap him, someone clever. We'll find some lawyers that are good at speaking, some that are cunning at trapping people. So these people go and say, Lord, we know that you are a teacher from God, and you do not care about no one, and you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God and truth. They flatter him. Far it be from us, my brethren. Flattering is not from God. Far it be from us. You know, my beloved brethren, how bad flattering is. And for the other person, not to praise someone and honor him. That is good. To tell him, well done, is good. But flattering someone is bad. While you do not believe that he is good, you tell him you are good. But inside you say, well, he's the worst of all. You are beautiful. Look at him, he's ugly. You are important and clever. This is flattering. This does bad to that person and to you. It is bad for the person that flatters and for the person that is receiving this flattering. Neither do we flatter and neither do we accept flattering. I point this out. Praising and telling someone well done and encouraging someone is good. Tell them good. You have done well until now. Be careful. Try even harder. Well done. Continue. This is a good thing. But to flatter someone is bad. You who are from God, you know everything, and you do not regard the person of man. Tell us now, is it forgiven from God that we should pay taxes to Caesar? And he's trying to deceive Christ. My brethren, you cannot deceive Christ. We cannot deceive Christ. It is better for you to repent than to persist. You cannot deceive him. You cannot deceive God, no one. I can tell you something else that is the truth. You can neither deceive people. You cannot deceive them. 
You cannot deceive a brother. And if you succeed once, second, third time, you will not succeed. God will make you known. He will reveal you. You cannot hide. We cannot hide, my brethren. It is best that we are sincere and clean and not need hiding. I will tell you that, forgive me, Lord, for saying this, but God has never let me not know what's happening. God will not let someone deceive you. And if God permits you one time to deceive someone, it's because He loves you. And a second time, because He doesn't want to reveal you yet. Nothing is hidden under the sun. Everything will come out to the open and be revealed. And the Lord said, Why are you testing me? Come, let me tell you the answer. And I really like His humility. He doesn't say, Get away from me, I don't want to talk to you. I've said this many times. Leave me alone. He never says, Leave me alone. You know how many times I've said, leave me alone? That is, well, come on now, I'm not going to talk with you. It's very bad. I'm going to talk with you. You don't understand anything. You're a hypocrite and everything. The Lord never said that. He said, bring me a, a coin. Whose is this inscription? Caesar's. We'll render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Do not confuse things. And he was silenced. Then the Sadducees came who did not believe in the resurrection. We will catch you now. You cannot catch Christ. You cannot trap your brother. You cannot trap a Christian. You cannot catch him. You cannot corner a Christian. You know why? Because God will deliver him. What are you trying to do now? Corner him. Humiliate him. Are you trying to tell him, you don't know, I do? God will be with him. And he will set him free and you will be humbled. Tell me now, teacher, there is a family, and the law of Moses says when a husband dies, his brother must have his wife. And there were seven brothers. The first died, the second took his wife. The second died, his, the third took his wife. Foolish things now. The third died, the fourth took her. All seven died, whose is this wife now? Is this a wife now? What can I say? What kind of a woman is this? To whom does it belong? And the Lord answered. This, these are foolish people. This is foolishness. So it doesn't come here, my man. You are greatly deceived. You are deceived because you do not know, first of all, the scriptures, and secondly, the power of God. And here let us think. Do we know the scriptures and the power of God? What does we know mean? Do we believe? Do we have experience with them? Are we sure that the word of God is the truth? Are we sure? It's the truth. It's the truth that God is Almighty. Are we sure about that? He is Almighty. What are you saying now? One woman, seven men. This is silly. In the resurrection of the dead, there are no husbands and wives. There are no male and female in that way. There are no couples. There in the kingdom of God, there is perfection. They were also silenced. But there was also a sincere person among them. He said, this is right what you said, a scribe. Tell us now, what's the first commandment of all? But he was talking to him with sincerity in his heart. What is the first commandment? What do you think? And this is nice, God likes it. What do you think, Lord? What is the first commandment? And the Lord answers and tells him, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. He is one. And this one Lord you must love with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But not only that, you must also love your neighbor as yourself. And he thought and said, True. Because all the other commandments were about whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. He said, Truly, truly, this is the first commandment of all. You are right. And look at this, my beloved brethren. He justified Christ. This is very important, my brethren. And the Lord told him also, You are not far from the kingdom of God. That is, let us say it more clearly and simply. The gospel is always right. Every man is a liar. But God is true. Only the word of God, only Christ is right. Even if you do not understand that. Even if you cannot realize this. Even if you, your soul becomes indignant in righteousness maybe. 
you are wrong and you haven't understood. The Word of God is right alone. Only the Gospel of Jesus Christ is right. They were all silenced. And before the Word of God, my beloved brethren, no one can stand. No one. I remember when my children were young, I used to tell them, everyone against me, come let us wrestle. They were babies, you know, I pretended to be strong with them. And I always beat them. But Valedini was clever. She used to say, Daddy, I'm with you. Daddy, I'm with you. And she'd hide behind me. And she was the only one who always won. And that has remained in my heart. And whenever I go, I say, Lord, I'm with you. I remember and I say, Jesus, I'm with you. I'm on your side. Never against the Word of God, my brethren. Never oppose God. The Word of God is right. Christ is right. Christ is almighty. I am with you, Lord. My younger Valadini was a scaredy cat. And whenever we wrestled, I always beat them, I tell you. But they were kids. I took him, I tied him in a knot. I pretended to be strong. And they were vanquished. But only Valadini was always a winner. I'll be with you, Dad. I am with you. I'm on your side, Dad. And since then, my brethren, this has been carved in my heart. Jesus, I always want to be on your side. I always want to be on you. You are right. I am wrong. And all the rest, they are all wrong. You are right. You are able. You know everything. Should we do this? No, Lord. You know what we must do. You know how much I suffered and was afflicted to come to this point that God brought me now to not know what I must ask for from Him. The scripture says, you do not know what to ask for. Up to one year ago, I knew what I wanted. I want this and the other and that thing. And the Lord didn't do any of these things. And when sometimes He did what I desired, it was the worst. And I say, Lord, I do not know what to ask for. Do anything you like, Jesus, in my life. Do anything you like. My brethren, we do not know what to ask for. We do not know. You do not know how and what to ask for. But the Holy Spirit prays on your behalf, and groanings and moans that cannot be uttered, because God knows. Hallelujah. Now the Lord will ask a question. Why do they say? And while he taught in the temple, Jesus answered and said, How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? For David himself said by the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore David himself calls him Lord. How is he then his son? We know this now. We know that Jesus Christ is the son of David, but he is also the Lord of Lords. The cunning hypocrites did not know it. That is, this humble person is the king of kings. Exactly. You mean... This church over here, which is John, Panayoti, Kasyani, all these are the bride of Christ. Exactly. Exactly that. This is Christ's bride. She doesn't look like something special. If you look at them closely, you see that they're the babes of this world. You're not the wise of this world, neither the most noble, neither the most important. This is the church of Christ. Exactly. The hypocrite cannot fathom this. So what? You're heretics. We're not heretics. Glory be to God. We are saved people. The love of God saved us. And we are grateful. We are grateful because our names have been written in the book of life. Because our leader is Christ. Because we have the bond of perfection which is love. We are grateful because we do not have divisions between us. And this is a great thing, my brethren. In the church, God has given us very good brethren. A brother told me once, the church has very good brethren. There are no groups, there are no divisions. This is the church of Christ. This is the grace of Christ. We are all grateful, are we, my brethren? We're grateful. You don't look like anything important. We don't look like anything important. It doesn't matter what we look like, my brethren. What matters is what Christ has made us. And Christ has made us kings and priests of the Most High. Do we look like priests and kings of the Most High? I do not know what we look like, but we are this, because Christ has made us. 
and in a short time when the trumpet will sound, God will reveal this to the world. He will reveal that these are the sons of the living God. Amen, my brethren. I want you to please pray for our trip, that God be with us. I do not know what we will do there, what will happen, but what I do know is that if God is with us, He will bless us. May the Lord bless us all, and I will see you now next Thursday, by the grace of Christ.